microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the 21st of September in the 38th week of 2012. For more than 20 years, our program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station, and when locked out of there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good folks that are men on public television. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoke. We'll take turns suggesting an item from the week's news that's been ignored or misrepor misreported, sometimes even innocently, and then giving the others a chance to com comment uh, on it. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking sense about American politics for more than twice the 20 years we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, either repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. Today is September 21st. On this day in 1780, American, in the American Revolutionary War, General Benedict Arnold gave the British forces the plans for the defenses of West Point, uh, making it easier for them, they thought, uh, for the British to occupy that spot, as they did. In 1792, 12 years later, the National Convention in France declared France a republic and abolished the monarchy. On this day in 1976, Orlando Letelier and an associate were assassinated in Washington, D.C. on Embassy Row. He was a member of the Chilean Socialist Government of Salvador Allende, which was overthrown by the Nixon-Kissinger administration, uh, and one Augusto Pinochet installed on the first 9-11, 9-11-1973, which had much worse consequences, of course, than the 9-11 that we recall. Uh, and on this day in 1993, Russian President Boris Yeltsin, uh, supported by the Clinton administration avidly, suspended the Russian parliament and scrapped the then functioning constitution, uh, thus triggering a constitutional crisis. The U.S. was working very hard to reduce uh, post-Soviet Russia to a third world country and uh, the uh, uh, famous alcoholic uh, Boris Yeltsin was doing his best to uh, put the American plans in place. You're watching News from Neptune, the Don't Trust Your Leaders edition, in which we call the words of the contemporary French philosopher Michel Serra, quote, neither information nor a drug fix ever gives any happiness when you have it, but will make you miserable when you don't, close quote. And Ron Zoke has the first hit tonight. Yes. Well, I wanted to start with uh, another note. This has become uh, uh, a kind of constant refrain, I guess, uh, from me anyway, on the uh, increasing economic polarization of the USA. Here's a headline from uh, uh, Reuters. Richest Americans' net worth jumps 1.7 trillion, mm -hmm. according to Forbes. The net worth of the richest Americans grew by 13% in the past year to 1.7 trillion, Forbes magazine said Wednesday. And a familiar cast populated the top of the annual list, including Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Larry Ellison, and the Koch brothers. The average net worth of the 400 wealthiest Americans rose to a record 4.2 billion, up uh, more than 10% from a year ago, while the lowest net worth came in, in this group at uh, 1.1 uh, billion versus 1.05 billion last year. The magazine said seven in 10 of the list members made their fortunes from scratch. This says it doesn't explain what they mean by that. So um, this is followed by another headline in the New York Times uh, this morning. Income data shows the widening gap between New York City's richest and poorest. The rich got richer and the poor got poorer in New York City last year. As the poverty rate increased, it reached its highest point in more than a decade. And the income gap in Manhattan, already wider than almost anywhere else in the country, rivaled disparities in sub-Saharan Africa. 
while the national recession officially ended in 2009, and Mayor Bloomberg has repeatedly proclaimed the city's robust recovery, the census figures released on Thursday painted a decidedly sober view of how New Yorkers are faring. To, quoting, to see this poverty rate jump almost a full percentage point is not a good sign, said David Jones, the president of the Community Service of New York in an anti-poverty anti advocacy and research group. Um, these poverty numbers reflect a national challenge. The U.S. economy has shifted and too many people are being left behind without the skills they need to compete and succeed, the mayor's deputy press secretary said on Wednesday. So uh, uh, will this be eventually treated as just a, uh, a PR problem or as a real problem? Meanwhile, a new report, um, article by Robert Frank, the or Cornell economist at the, uh, uh, on Yahoo Finance, Study, tax cuts for the rich don't, don't spur growth. This is contrary to a lot of that we've been hearing that uh, essentially if we make the big rich rich enough, richer still, uh, yeah, some of that money will start to uh, trickle down and they will be job creators and it will be good for the rest of us. It just isn't true, but uh, of course it keeps getting repeated over and over again often enough that uh, maybe some of the people saying it actually believe it and some of those hearing it may actually believe it too. Cutting taxes for the wealthy does not generate faster economic growth, according to a new report, but these cuts may widen the income gap between the rich and the rest, according to uh, another report. A study from the Congressional Research Service, the nonpartisan research office of Congress, shows that there is little evidence over the past 65 years that tax cuts for the highest earners are associated with savings, investment, or productivity growth. In fact, the study found that higher tax rates for the wealthy are statistically associated with higher levels of growth. The finding is likely to fuel the already bitter political fight over taxing the rich with President Obama and the Democrats calling for higher taxes on the wealthy to reduce the deficit and fund spending. Mitt Romney and the GOP advocate lower marginal tax rates for the top earners, saying that they fuel investment and job creation. So uh, uh, there's more details here on, uh, on that. Uh, final uh, note on uh, this point. Another article today, longevity study, uh, average age at death for various subgroups of the population. Life expectancy shrinks for the less educated white, whites in the US. This is viewed as serious because always before we've been hearing that life expectancy is uh, increasing. And uh, now the latest results show that um, it's not true for certain subgroups. Quoting, for generations of Americans, it was a given that children would live longer than their parents, but there is now mounting evidence that this enduring trend has reversed itself for the country's least educated whites and an increasingly troubled group whose life expectancy has fallen by four years since 1900. Researchers have long documented that the most educated Americans were making the biggest gains in life expectancy, but now they say mortality data show that the lifespans of some of the least educated Americans are actually contracting. Four years, uh, four studies in recent years identified modest declines, but a new one that looks at separately at Americans lacking a high school diploma found disturbingly sharp drops in life expectancy for whites in this group. Experts are uh, experts not involved in the research said its findings were persuasive. So the reasons are uh, unclear. Uh, they try to go uh, into that. The general picture, as uh, we've said before in here, is that uh, the poor uh, uh, live uh, five years less uh, than the uh, wealthy. So uh, at the same time, uh, we have... Uh, Mr. Romney and others, uh, ideologues of free enterprise and uh, the uh, free market telling us that we uh, need to uh, move more in uh, that direction and uh, that uh, Americans, uh, the 47% who won't vote for him are uh, uh, 
whiners, complainers have a victim mentality, and uh, uh, at the same time, it seems to me, after looking at all this stuff, that the uh, biggest uh, whiners and self-pitying uh, crybabies are among the very rich who keep telling us that uh, the uh, tax system is punishing uh, 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 success, uh, 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 productivity, uh, achievement, and the rest. And uh, that is just uh, so absurd. So uh, do you ha laugh when you hear that or cry or what? Carl, David? Probably a little of both, David. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah one, one sort of technical point I would make in response to the article about, uh, about lowered uh, lifespans of uh, people who didn't graduate from high school, I think it might be uh, possible for people to take away from the idea that the, the lowered lifespan is a result of their lack of edu education, where in, in fact it's, it's their poverty and those aren't necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we might be inclined to think that uh, less educated people don't know how to eat right and don't know how to exercise right, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that would be sort of an unfair sort of classist ar argument to make or assumption to make about the reason uh, people are uh, at that level are dying earlier. It's because uh, they're uh, a part of a larger sub subset of people. I mean, it, there wouldn't be a, necessarily a, a firm line between those who are, uh, you know, who didn't graduate from high school and who did graduate from high school. But there would be what what we see is a gradual uh, Im immiseration that has its effects on uh, various aspects of life at this sort of population health level or public health level that um, don't necessarily, uh, you know, that, 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 that certainly result in, in behaviors that might make it less likely to, to live, live long, but those behaviors don't necessarily represent the choices of, of those people. And beyond that, I think what's so fascinating about this article in, a, in obviously a very gruesome way is that it's, it, I think it might even mention in the article, um, it's rem reminiscent of the decreased lifespans in Russia uh, subsequent to the fall right. of the Soviet Union, right. where men, uh, li men uh, of uh, the non-elite classes, came to live an average of seven in a seven years fewer in a in a, just a matter of a, a few years or or a decade or two lifespans of of middle class quote unquote middle class Russian men decreased radically. That's because of the disappearance of the public health system, right? Primarily. Yeah, I, I don't part yeah. of it. Yes, yeah, surely. Uh, the, um, you uh, rightly mentioned these uh, studies of uh, inequality and so forth, uh, uh, Ron. The classic study beginning in some ways of the modern generation of inequality studies that uh, we were talking last time about uh, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson's book, The Spirit Level. Uh, the title's a little misleading. Uh, it has uh, more, the title is British, uh, but the spirit level is, the subtitle is Why Greater Equality Makes Society Stronger. Uh, and their thesis, which they trace through a great deal of statistical information, is that it's not, as it were, absolute wealth and so forth in a society that makes for uh, uh, better social outcomes. It's equality, even if the average uh, income or wealth uh, is lower than societies that uh, are less equal. Uh, and this grew out, first of all, of one of the major modern studies uh, was an attempt a decade or so ago to um, look at the factors that made for longevity, just the point that you, you raise on this recent information. Um, and there was a, quite, a, quite a massive study looking at the developed societies and trying to say, okay, uh, let's consider things like like uh, diet, smoking, uh, you know, hours worked, uh, leisure, or things of this sort. Let's put as many things as we can together here and look at the societies which um, have the greatest longevity and the factors that make for them. And, uh, you know, doing these wonderful sort of correlations that you can do with a big computer like the one down the street. Uh, and. Uh, they found that the uh, correlation, the highest correlation between longevity, first of all, the society with the greatest longevity in general was Japan. And that the correlation was to equality 
not inequality. Uh, the J Japanese smoke more, their diet is not as healthy as some other societies and so forth. But it is a more equal society. Uh, the paradoxes or the ironies here are great. Uh, probably because of General Douglas MacArthur, uh, who occupied, Japan, led the American occupation of Japan after the Second World War and destroyed the old elites in Japan and produced, not really intending to, but the effect was to produce a more egalitarian society than any that existed elsewhere, elsewhere in the development and developed world. Japan at the end of the war was of course an extremely poor society, but equality in a two generations since the end of the Second World War produced the greatest longevity. Yeah. Well, that's a hard thing, apparently, for some people to grasp or to uh, believe that consider uh, two groups or two societies with exactly the same average uh, income, one of them highly equalitarian, the other highly uh, inequalitarian. And any measure of social welfare or uh, happiness or satisfaction with life and so on will typically be uh, significantly higher in the more equalitarian group. And again, it's not the absolute level, but the disparity within the society that seems to be uh, correlated uh, with those kinds of measures. And that very word, disparity, stands here as a, uh, uh, a sort of motto over the entrance to the uh, uh, American-dominated world after the Second World War, uh, the disparity, uh, the disparity that even Mr. Romney was talking about it in his private moment a week or so ago. Uh, the disparity is exactly the issue uh, in the famous memorandum that George Kennan, a liberal foreign policy uh, uh, guru, uh, put forward in the late 1940s about American post-war policy, where he pointed out that America had 5% of the world's population and 50% of the world's wealth, and that the task of American foreign policy was to, quote, maintain the disparity. Mr. Romney, uh, spoke, speaking last week about the vast disparity uh, in American society, pointed out that those the other side wasn't going to vote for him. His job was to maintain the disparity. Uh, and this works economically and politically. Uh, we maintain the disparity by the big lie that we have to fight the deficit uh, from both parties, and we maintain the disparity in foreign policy by the big lie from both parties that we have to fight terrorism. So the goal's the same. Uh, the structure of, of politics uh, is quite similar uh, over time, over these two generations in American society, and it's uh, masked by these classic lies, the deficit and terrorism. You're watching News from Neptune, uh, our spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the News of the Week and its coverage by the media. Sometimes sounds rehearsed because we said these things before. Yes. You know, I mean, my God. Uh, I mean, but they happen to be true and you don't hear them elsewhere. That's true. <laughs> I, I, I obviously agree that that's true. And I just said just something maybe we haven't quite, a little bit of a different angle than perhaps what, what, what we've mentioned. I know I've mentioned Dean Baker many times on the program, uh, 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 economist with the Center for Economic and Policy Research in Washington and uh, a, blog, a, a daily blogger in response to the economic news, mostly in the New York Times and Washington Post and also NPR and other major media outlets. And one of the points he stressed uh, recently in response to all the concern about tax levels and so forth, um, and we often talk about talking about wealth rather than income, but what, what, um, what um, Baker has been talking about the last few days is th the idea that when we're talking about taxes rather than income, we've already lost the mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. uh, the so so-called pr you know progressive point of view has has already lost in the sense that if we're just talking about income without talking about the governmental policies that have favored the rising incomes and produced the rising incomes of a certain class of the upper class of, of, of people, then we don't fully understand what the effect of government intervention on the economy actually has been in favor of the, the, the rich. He often, he, the, the major points that he makes repeatedly in his critiques of uh, 
everyday jur journalism have to do with the fact that lower income workers have put in, been put into competition with foreign workers, whereas professional workers like doctors and lawyers have not. He also repeatedly mm -hmm. points out that patent laws and copyright laws have allowed especially pharmaceutical uh, companies, mm -hmm. among others, and, and he often refers to Bill Gates in this context also, have allowed people to exercise what in ec economics are called rents on their products, which drain hundreds of billions of dollars on a yearly basis from the pockets of av 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 average people. Um, he pointed out one, one fascinating fact uh, that I, I was not aware of, uh, uh, that when Medicare was established in 1965, there was nothing in it about drugs because, as as Baker put it, it would have been it would have liked it would have been like putting band aids in it. It just was such a trivial aspect of our economy in the up until the mid 1960s that nobody thought about uh, uh, phar pharmaceutical benefits of that time. Well, 40 years later, 45 years later. We've got hundred. We've got a hundreds of billions of dollars, pharmaceutical industry that that exacts exorbitant rents on the population and on the healthcare system because of patent and copyright laws that have been passed. Obviously, because it lobbies for them. It's been pointed out that if we had a system, uh, a single payer system, and in, in the jargon, like Canada or France or Britain, even, uh, the, we would um, have the sorts of controls on big pharma and on medical costs uh, that would make the deficit go away. Yeah, uh, it's uh, <laughs> at some point to this also uh, concerning why our uh, internet system is uh, slower and more expensive than those in many other countries. Uh, there's too much competition. This may seem counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but uh, all of this stuff about uh, copyrights and patents and so on means the system is so fractionated, everyone trying to make a little more money off, or s off some marginally different thing, that uh, uh, the uh, internet systems in uh, Korea, France, and a number right. of other countries are uh, vastly superior to ours. They're faster, cheaper, and uh, much better on the whole. And the ironies there can uh, continue because, of course, the basic structure of the internet system was developed by the military. Yes. I, mean, yes. It was, yeah, uh, I wanted to come back to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let, us, uh, uh, let us press on. David, you have uh, uh, anything happening with schools these days? Dave? Anything happening? <laughs> you must have. You're looking over my shoulder here. No. You're cheating, <laughs> yeah, you're cheating on the test. That's true, and, and violating our notion of rehearsing. Yes, now, okay. I have also, Can I simply wanted to mention that. around here? <laughs> Ron and it's I not have the our, Constitution, hey. Ron and I have our red squares on from Quebec, and I gather the yeah. Chicago Teachers Union adopted that uh, as, a, uh, yeah. as a sign of sympathy, hey? Yeah. I wanted, yeah, I wanted to make a few comments about, uh, in relation to the Chicago teachers' strike, um, of, I, I hope these aren't too nuanced and subtle to be put forward concisely on television, on, on uh, you know, a television show. But, but they, what I'm playing off here is an article in the New York Times, a column by Joe Nocera uh, on, uh, I guess it was Tuesday or Monday. Um, about the Chicago teachers' strike and the result of that. And Nocera, in this art column, How to Fix the Schools, um, kind of bypasses the perspective of the Chicago teachers and bypasses the perspective of the, of the, uh, the so-called school reformers that, Rahm, that Mayor Rahm Emanuel rep represents uh, in, the, in, this, in this conflict. I think, uh, I think Nocera is negligent and... Um, disrespectful in a sense in this column by not even allowing the Chicago teachers one word to speak for themselves to describe what they were about in in this in this strike because I think they made it pretty clear but given that let me make a few comments and maybe this will sound ins insensitive also um, I I of course support the the Chicago teachers union in their strike, especially because it was a, a very much reformed teachers union, not uh, in the classic mold of the of conservative uh, American top-down unionism. Um, never, nevertheless, um, I, think, I think we should be clear what this strike was about. I don't think, you know, it, it's, it's clear that the, the teachers 
uh, need and perhaps should present their case in terms of what is best for their work and for the children who they, who they teach. Still, this should also be seen, and perhaps isn't seen enough, in the context of labor strife and class warfare in this country. And it's clear that the, the, union, the union didn't necessarily want to, at least for point number one, put itself in that context, but it should be put in that context. Uh, and the reason I say that is that even if the Chicago teachers won, quote unquote, even if they struck a blow against um, the kind of onerous uh, testing uh, and, and so forth and the, the kind of neoliberal reform model for public schools, even if they struck a blow against all that, um, th this will not be part of a broad movement towards economic equality in this, in this country because school reform can't at this level really be part of that. It really has to be part of a much larger working class and political movement that establishes a very different context in which to which we can understand the roles and purposes and functions of edu education in this in this country. Um, one thing that Nocera does in this article is he refers to he well his article is based on an interview with a man named uh, Mark Tucker, who is a head of something called president of something called the National Center for e Education and the e e Economy, uh, one of these think tanks that in a, prob a relatively less offensive way supports neoliberal reform, but nevertheless supports neoliberal educational reform. Now, it, it buys into the same old conventional wisdom that our students need more skills to compete with students from other countries. And sure, there are models in other countries that are referred to and that re are referred to in this article, Finland, Singapore, and so forth, which have different educational systems that respect teachers more and that are doing things in, obviously, in a much smaller context that create better, create uh, superior, superior educational outcomes than what we have in this country. But when you go to the, to the website of this NCEE, -E, you find they're supported by the same funders that are funding neoliberal and reform and neoliberal educational reform in this country. Bill Gates, um, here, let's, let, me, let me see, I've got it. Uh, Walmart, Bill Gates, the Broad, that's Eli Broad Fa Foundation, uh, Lilly, Rockefeller, Carnegie, Ford, all of the usual names that have so influenced for decades now uh, educational reform in this country. And to make a very broad sweeping statement, but I think um, a true statement, um, let me, let me, con let me con you know, conclude by saying that educational reform, the history of educational reform in this country has been about uh, corporate increasing corporate influence on how schools are under understood. No, no matter how high-minded it, it might sound, um, when you hear names like Ford, Rockefeller, Car 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 Carnegie, no, no less Gates, Walton, Lilly, uh, pharmaceuticals, of course, uh, what one is talking about is sort of the same old, same old that uh, uh, that somehow better schools will, or better, better, a better educational system will address fundamental ec ec economic problems. And it wasn't, you know, uh, in, in spite of the fact that obviously schools need to be improved and reformed in ways that create better environments for teachers and students to work and learn, none of this has anything to do as it is assumed in articles like this with uh, larger, the larger ec 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 sort of com global com 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 you know, competitive context because it really isn't about the global competitive context. It's about the class context. David, let me ask you one question about that. Uh, mm -hmm. Does neoliberal educational reform uh, translate into or at least uh, instantiate as the uh, movement for pro for-profit charter schools, is that what it means? Well, that's one, cer certainly one method of, that's one goal of the, of the, um, of the, of the neoliberal reform uh -huh. movement is to bring, 
what they call co com competition into yeah. uh, that public schools would improve if they had to compete with other models of schooling. Uh. And again, <laughs> you know, you know, I this is this is a quibble per perhaps, but certainly the research hasn't shown yeah. that achievement, meaning test scores, are better in charters in charter schools than they are in in public schools, but. My, my view is that that isn't the argument that the public schools ought to be making. I right. mean, sure, if you could obviously right. show right. that they were fantastically better, then there would be something they uh -huh. would have to, have to respond to. But I think that what, what, public, what defenders of public schools too often do is sort of seed that argument about test yeah. scores achievement and that kind of con concretization. Now, you know, the Chicago public schools put in lots of good talking points about it isn't about test scores. It's about arts and music right. and cutbacks and various p programs, and that's the right thing to uh, be I to see. be saying, and not and not necessarily just just say, well, we're just doing a good job. And and I think they did that, and that that, that is what made this a kind of a different kind of strike. They they didn't necessarily buy into the argument that um, we're going to do a better job of raising test scores. Charter schools won't be. I heard one story in the midst of this strike that that I found quite striking. Um, the uh, uh, a guy, one, a member of the uh, uh, the striking teachers group, uh, uh, said he's a biology teacher in tenth grade in Chicago, uh, and uh, his kids for the new year had been in class for a week, and they were required to take a a, a test on the relationship of RNA and DNA. I vaguely know what that means, but apparently the, the, the chemical relationships are in DNA. He says, of course, we haven't talked about that, and the kids didn't have it any year before, but they need to give the test now to establish a baseline to find out how much better the kids do after they've been taught the stuff yeah. when they're given a test at the end of the year. Right. So the first week of school in the biology class, uh, you give the test, uh, you give these students tests on material they've never seen before uh, in order to establish that baseline to show the improvement, of course, by the of the year. Now, this is madness. I mean, this is just craziness. And, uh, you know, if that's what you're going to do, you're going to prove school by raising such test scores. Why, something very odd is going on. Yeah, it's as if uh, an industrial engineer has been called in to uh, yeah. uh, an efficiency expert right. like uh, F.W. Taylor or uh, someone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, we'll deal with the gains uh, then. Has Diane uh, Ravitch uh, weighed in on what's you've going had on a, Chicago. you've had some views on her over year over the years, David. Yeah, you? well, I uh, I have, and of course, she was what people who aren't who who aren't as familiar with the field of educational policy studies and educational historiography as I am uh, know that she was the bet, bet noir of the of the of uh, of of radical educational reformers and radical critics of the sort of corporatized educational system since, since the nineteen eighties. Or, or late seventies, she was writing uh, critiques in response to I think some of the, the people had better ideas, um, and she's 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 come and after working with people like William Bennett and Chester Finn and the familiar sort of Reagan era people, who who began this whole who not began but who really kicked in this sort of neoliberal uh, process, uh, she's kind of you know I I have to every so often we have to acknowledge that somebody who comes back over to our side, okay, you know, move move on. Um, I was a little upset about that because she was so, people who didn't know her background were so willing to say and to, and to start quoting her rather than quoting the people who, who had always been saying that stuff. Yeah. But I guess that's the way it works. There's a kind of star system. So when you get a star on your side, yeah. then you have to go with it. Okay. And that's fine. <laughs> and I think she is sincere in her in her in her views, yeah, I think she, she's been consistent. Almost uh, uh, done an almost complete about face. It seems to me you don't yeah. believe in regeneration yeah. or deathbed yeah. conversions or yeah. anything. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I don't think she doesn't. She hasn't positive. She's positive, very critical view towards neoliberal reform. She hasn't um, come across to the a, a, a truly more radical and humane point of view, perhaps that would be identified with somebody like Jonathan Kozal Co or, or people like that who've, who would, or, or, you know, Howard Zinn or, you know, the people up in, up in, up in Wisconsin at the um, uh, Rethinking Schools and so forth. But that's, that's fine. I mean, she's, she's, she's saying some good things and there's no reason 
for people like me to be, you know, to be personal about it. Sometimes you have to be, you have to be bigger than that, you know? so, so they say. <laughs> so, you know, um, let me just read one thing before we finish, before we finish this topic to, to sort of highlight my point. And I think this my, is you being bigger. What, yeah, this is me being bigger. Okay. What the, what, no, no, this, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just to summarize, there's, there's a quote here uh, from the National Center on Education and Economy, uh, which is referred to as a not-for-profit policy analysis and development or, or organization, et cetera. Uh, its stated mission, to analyze the implications of changes in the international economy for American education, formulate, and formulate an agenda for ma American education based on that analysis, and seek wherever possible to accomplish that agenda through policy change and development of the resources educators would need to carry it out. That all sounds very good and very rational, and I would just, I would say once more that that doesn't address the fundamental issues in American ed education, which are the fundamental issues in American society, which is that um, work doesn't pay anymore. Right. right. Thank you, David. Um, uh, do you further comment on that, Ron? Or you, uh, we uh, no, go ahead, Carl. We move I'll, on? I'll yeah. come back to something else. I have a, uh, uh, a line that I wanted to take up today uh, that uh, I can base on one of Noam Chomsky's observations. Uh, uh, Chomsky has said on several occasions, uh, and I quote, if you don't believe in free speech for views you despise, you don't believe in it at all. And uh, certain events of the recent weeks has raised again the question of how American liberalism, and by this I mean, of course, both parties, uh, both political parties and the general discourse of politics in America, um, handles that problem. I mean, we have this tradition of free speech supposedly enshrined in limitations on the government and the First Amendment, but uh, obviously uh, the American ruling class has got to get around that in all sorts of ways uh, and does it all the time, up to and including uh, summary, uh, summary executions of uh, people who exercise their free speech rights uh, in favor of uh, encouraging resistance to American American uh, invasion of the Middle East. That's what happened to American citizen Anwar al-Awlaki. Uh, Obama killed him, not because he was operationally involved in uh, activities, uh, terrorist activities, as the government complained, uh, claimed after he was killed, uh, but because he was an effective spokesman uh, for the resistance to American penetration in the Middle East. Um, so, you know, be careful of what you say uh, in spite of American liberalism's uh, presumed comment of free speech, uh, 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 presumed commitment to free speech. Uh, the way to get around that in American liberal politics is usually to say, uh, well, free speech is fine, but you can't incite violence. Uh, for example, you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. Now that has been uh, for a good while a liberal bromide that uh, is used to uh, er erase, essentially, a free speech uh, for uh, views that are dangerous to the uh, uh, American ascendancy. Uh, the source of that line is worth looking to. It's a paraphrase of a Supreme Court decision by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., uh, in a case called Schenck versus the United States from 1919. Uh, Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who, by the way, parenthetically here, uh, this great liberal hero of the early 20th century turns out to be the source of some of the worst uh, and illiberal decisions uh, that the Supreme Court, that live on from the Supreme Court of that era, including Buck v. Bell that uh, 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 allowed involuntary sterilization and so forth uh, on the grounds that these people were idiots and therefore it was okay to sterilize them in spite of the Constitution. I mean, views that would sit very nicely, of course, with Mr. Romney this last week, I suppose. But um, this was Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, Jr., as well. Uh, in the... Uh, 
case under consideration, Schenck versus the United States in 1919. Uh, Holmes wrote the opinion for unanimous court. I shouldn't blame it all on him. Hey, it was going around. Uh, he ruled that it was a violation of the Espionage Act of 1917, a particularly repressive bit of legislation from the Wilson administration that only was used twice after, the, uh, after it was passed in 1917 until the Obama administration came along. The Obama administration has used it six times. Uh, Holmes ruled that in that Schenck, the man in question here in this case, was in violation of the Espionage Act of 1917, amended by the way by the Sedition Act of 1918. I mean, there's more to it, eh? Uh, he violated by distributing flyers, you know, paper, uh, opposing the draft during World War One. Now, this was a violation of the Espionage Act, according to Justice Holmes, and it was equivalent to shouting fire in a crowded theater to tell people that the draft was unconstitutionally legal and should be opposed. Holmes argued that the abridgment of Schenck's free speech was permissible because he represented a clear and present danger, that's where the phrase came from, to the government's recruitment efforts for the war. Now remember, Wilson had dragged an unwilling American populace kicking and screaming into an ongoing European war uh, by 1917 after running for president on the grounds that he was the peace candidate. Uh, his motto was, he kept you out of war. You know, yeah, he did, and then he immediately got you into war once he got reelected again. Sound familiar? Uh, in any case, um, the uh, Schenck was guilty, uh, according to Holmes, because he had dared to speak, and indeed actual print flyers, against the draft. Uh, it's list interesting to listen to what Holmes said, quote, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing panic. The question in every case is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that will, they will bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. Now, be clear about the, what the substantive evil was opposition to the draft, people being refusing to participate in what was seen as a, an amazingly un-American activity, conscripting people into war. Uh, many Americans are descended from folks who came to America in the 19th century precisely to escape conscription into European armies. But, all right. Um, now, the, uh, uh, the Fire in a Crowded Theater is also used most famously in connection with the case of Eugene Debs, because Debs was uh, convicted later uh, and held in prison when others were released, uh, essentially for violating the same Espionage Act uh, on the same grounds that he had counseled uh, people to resist the draft for the war. Uh, the long history of the American draft uh, is worth looking at here, uh, not because I think it's coming back, it's not, but because it gives us a fairly good idea of how this uh, liberal assault on free speech in America is carried out. Of course we believe in free speech, but you can't shout fire in a crowded theater. You can't say the government uh, shouldn't draft you to fight in an illegal foreign war. And that's quite an argument, and one that should be um, uh, uh, yeah. We believe in free speech, but it shouldn't be abused. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. It must but, be exercised responsibly. But, uh, and understand what the abuse is there. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, and, and the willingness of the American government, uh, once again, regardless of which party happens to be running the government at the moment, it really doesn't make any difference, um, the willingness of the American government uh, to abuse free speech in spite of the First Amendment uh, is pretty overwhelming, and we have seen uh, egregious examples of that during the current administration. Uh, one of the more interesting ones, I think, was the request by the government uh, that they channeled it through uh, uh, Obama's um, sponsor in the Senate, uh, Senator Joe Lieberman, uh, the request by the government to keep um, Visa, MasterCard, uh, the other private corporations that handle banking charge issues, um, to cut off uh, any transfers of funds to WikiLeaks. Now, it worked perfectly. Why were they doing that? Well, you know, uh, it was a straight-out abuse of free speech. Here, WikiLeaks had done something the government didn't like, 
uh, done something as bad as counseling people uh, to fight the draft. It has revealed the war crimes that the U.S. was committing, uh, particularly in the famous uh, collateral murder video, but it also revealed many other things about the lies and misrepresentations uh, that the American government was involved in, in its imperial policies, particularly uh, war crimes around the world. Now, this uh, th revelation of the crimes of the American government constituted a clear and present danger, surely, in Justice Holmes' thought. My God, they're talking about it. They're telling people what we're doing. We've got to stop that. And they put a stop to that free speech by putting a stop to the support for the group that was uh, handling it. So the, uh, this, this administration particularly, but all recent administrations, have been particularly vigorous in uh, finding those liberal ways to stop free speech. Uh, it gets worse, it's getting worse, and we should be aware of it. This depends on the doctrine that, uh, well, donating money is, uh, is speech, right? Yeah. Yeah. What's the status of donating to the IRA or Hamas? Well, that's a very good point. I mean, uh, you can donate to the Ku Klux Klan perfect, through MasterCard and, uh, and Visa. Uh, the IRA, which is, uh, uh, you know... Uh, a con rather conventional and fairly right-wing political party in the south of Ireland right now. Yeah, sure, you can send them money if you want. Uh, you can pay your bill at the local brothel, uh, in spite of the fact they're deal in dealing in activities that are considered illegal, at least in some states. Uh, you know, this is no problem, but you can send money to WikiLeaks. And uh, they've had trouble finding ways to... Uh, 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 to to receive contributions, uh, although it can be done now if you work if you work hard at it. The the example is the example of what the uh, the links that the uh, U.S. government will do to uh, get around those things that it's supposed to be uh, prevented from doing by the Bill of Rights. Uh, as I say, that's getting worse and worse. Well, <laughs> let me say this uh, or question this: um, free speech has been on the the docket for the last week or 10 days, obviously because of the situation in Libya with the murder of uh, assassination or murder of uh, our am ambassador there, allegedly as a consequence of, uh, of an um, insightful film, anti-Islamic film. And so uh, the manner in which this, this has been commonly interpre interpreted, and I would say uh, sort of in a, in a self-serving way, has been very in in the media one way has to, has been to make the the uh, make this film and the ex expressions in this film an issue of of free speech and it's just I guess one thing that's you know you know impressed me or impacted me is that when the student columnists who've written about this in the Daily Daily Illini don't seem to have any other way of processing what's going on over there except as an issue of free speech and appropriate responses to, to free speech and perhaps the issue of responsible free speech and considering what the, what the consequences of one's speech might be. There doesn't seem to be at all, there's in the, I think, two columnists and perhaps one ed editorial, uh, one general editorial, that there are larger issues going on over there w without which we can't understand um, what what happened if we indeed do understand what happened if it really even had anything to do with this film but so it seems like the issue of free speech often pops up at times when the issue really really isn't free speech yeah. or well, shouldn't be at, at least at a primary level i understand that uh, the trailer's been taken down because due to a civil suit well, the actress claimed she was uh, duped and misinformed about the nature of the film and so on mm -hmm. so that's what did it it wasn't an issue of free speech uh, at all uh, to her. But, but the government got in touch with Google and right. asked Google if they would, would please take it on. Google, right. to their credit at least, yeah. did not take it down at first. Yeah. But then they found other ways to do it, sort of a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I would suggest that this actor probably had more contact with the American government in the last two weeks than she's had in her entire life. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in any case, I mean, but let's go back to this, David. I mean, there is a problem here. You know, there is, Glenn Greenwald has a very good column up this week where he takes up these uh, right-wingers who are suddenly, suddenly discovered the merits of free speech when it comes to, defend the, it comes to defending this um, uh, anti 
uh, Islam film and uh, uh, what a new set of cartoons in a French magazine and things like that and say, oh, this is just free speech. Uh, but as you say, that has to be put in a much larger context. But even in a larger context, you'd finally have to say, wouldn't you, that the uh, free speech arguments are correct, that we shouldn't suppress the, uh, the government shouldn't, and we shouldn't allow the government to, suppress the even something like this uh, horrendous uh, uh, amateur film from the West Coast, right? I mean, even if, in fact, what seems to be the case, there may well have been, uh, may, may well have been um, politically interested groups uh, from Israel or the United States behind it in the first place. So, but but you, still, you still can't go to the point where you say, well, we've got to prevent them from showing that or putting it on YouTube or anything like that, don't we? Yes, I, I think so, and then move beyond that and talk yes. about what Islamophobia Precisely. is, and even Islamophobia itself isn't the real issue. Exactly. I, I consider that to be a kind of symptom. Uh, I, I, I think Islamophobia, there's a kind of a wink and a nod to Islamophobia in this country. I think it's a real problem, but it isn't that I think that the leaders of this country are doing what they do because they have a problem yeah, with this Islam. Exactly. Obviously, they don't. They've supported the, Sa the Saudi sure. di dynasty for about 80 years now. And Sa you know, Saudi Arabia is second only to <laughs> Israel as an American client in the region, and for the same reasons. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, no, I... Yeah, yeah. I think the, the, the government has some problems there. They sort of have to titrate Islamophobia uh, in the sense yes. that they need some of it because it helps the propaganda. Oh, we've yeah. got to get those mad, you know, the Christopher Hitchens line, you know. We, we've got to get those crazy people who believe in religion and therefore want to kill us. We've got to kill them first. Um, that, they need that for propaganda purposes, but they want too much of that yeah. because that does sort of uh, sour our relations with the Saudis and the Indonesians and people who we need uh, who also have a lot of oil. I I mean, uh, you know, we can't go too far with this. So the government's in, in a difficult position here, don't, aren't they? don't you feel sorry it's, for them? Yeah, yeah, I, of, of course, <laughs> as always. And, and it's like I, we were talking before the program about what the difference between Obama and Romney really is. Uh, and Romney uh, tends to say some uh, uncouth or interpret, but, but in, in a certain way, honest things. And it's a related issue, uh, as we were talking about before, has to do with the comments he made when he was in Israel a couple of months yes. ago and made comments that were widely publicized about the uh, inferiority of Palestinian culture and they just don't know how to get their, to act responsibly and uh, uh, you know, develop their economy and be entrepreneurs and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and a big deal was made about it on the websites I read on Mondo Weiss and all that. And I'm, uh, all through it, I'm thinking, how is this, as in so many other aspects of Israel, Iran, Hamas, et cetera, et cetera, how is this really any different from what Obama is actually doing? You know, yeah. whatever he says, and Iran is the same deal. How is all right. this, whatever, exactly. all this pressure Netanyahu is putting on Romney and uh, subverting and interfering our electoral process, how is what Romney is proposing any different than what Obama is actually doing for four, now that we've had another almost four years of expanding settlements and so on and so forth. The case that says more about what free speech in Obama's America is than any other, I think, well, or at least it does say that, uh, is a, there's a Pakistani guy sitting in a federal prison in New York right now who was sentenced in t 2009 to six years in jail for a serious free speech crime. His crime was including a Hezbollah news channel in the cable package he offered for sale to television viewers in Brooklyn. Uh, people who could get this, now Hezbollah, remember, is a political party, in fact, a more of the dominant political party in Lebanon right now, uh, and they put out, they have a television channel like RT or AFP or BBC, yeah. You, so you could get the Lebanese BBC from this guy's cable package in Brooklyn. Um, uh, he was charged with material support for terrorism and is serving six years in jail for it. Now that is real suppression of free speech. And that's the Obama administration at work. So. I, I would encourage you to look at the Counterpunch website today. They have a writer who regularly writes there. May, I, if I'm getting his name right, it's Assam Al Amin, and um, he's he's a kind of a is a person with. I, it says in this column that he's he's an, he's an, he, he is now in e Egypt, 
Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's where he always is. It, it never says anything about him. I sense it's because he doesn't want yeah, anybody yeah. to know anything uh -huh. about him. And what he writes on Counterpunch, you know, there's so much on Counterpunch that it's hard to read all of it, and, and, can, and even on that website compared to other websites. But um, um, I, would, I would encourage you to read that column because at the end of that column, what he does is he uses language that was used to suppress um, anti-Israel and anti-Semitic anti speech, and he applies it. Uh, he applies it as if it were, you know, as if it were in 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 the future, using to suppress other kinds kinds of speech. And I think it's quite accurate. It's been actually pretty easy for Congress to pass laws shutting people up when yep. it comes to is is Israel and issues of alleged anti-Semitism. And as Oliver Wendell Holmes showed, uh, it's not just limited to Israel. He's uh, managed to shut people up with a uh, bromide about fire in a crowded theater uh, long before Israel was founded, and it's perfectly useful today, too. Concluding comments, Ron? No, I wanted to get to another point, going back actually a step or two. I uh, found this book by Paul Hawken, uh, written some 20 years ago. It talks about the two welfare systems in this country, and I'd never seen it uh -huh. put that clearly before. One for the rich and one for the oh, poor. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, you know, we need to explore some of the, the vast uh, welfare system uh, for the rich that uh, rarely gets discussed. Hey, Mr. Romney, he, he never got anything. <laughs> Somebody helped him, right? right? Well, Isn't that what he said? Yeah, dramatic he example, that, right? uh, yeah. uh, DARPA and the Internet. Yeah, yeah. An enormous amount of yeah. public money and support went exactly. into that. And now we have... Until it became profitable and then yeah, yeah. it's turned over to private industry. Yeah, yeah. and then they're making uh, millions and billions off it. And here we are, uh, brought to you, I'm happy to say, on that very Internet these days because UPTV is live streaming these programs. If you're watching us television or if you're seeing us live stream, know that you can see us on live streaming. Uh, go to the website... Uh, urbanapublictelevision.org, all one word, urbanapublictelevision.org, and go to live stream. And you can catch this and other programs uh, on UPTV through that uh, through your computer. These UPTV guys must have gone to the right schools. They're yes. always innovating. Uh, <laughs> there you are, sure. Uh, if you want a good job, get good education. Yeah, so <laughs> here they are at UPTV. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, after after all, we should mention that uh, there are some excellent programs coming up on UPTV, uh, and if you like what you heard this evening, you may like some of these, too. Uh, tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., The David Pakman Show. At 8 a.m., In Focus, Muslim Targets, The Power of Salafists. Uh, Salafists. That's from Deutsche Welle, the German news service. This program investigates how, how Salafists, that is extremely conservative and devout Muslims, travel throughout cities in Germany attempting to convert the young urban to their faith. You know, they sound like Mormons. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> At 2 p.m. tomorrow, uh, news from Neptune, a repeat of the program you're watching now. At 3 p.m., the Populist Dialogues, Fossil Fuel Problem, Clean Energy Contracts Solution. Um, climate change is fueled by the use of fossil, fossil fuels. Plans for U.S. Uh, a point, by the way, that the late Alex Coburn might want to argue with you, but uh, it's certainly generally accepted. Plans for U.S. export of coal and liquefied natural gas are discussed, as well as ways to keep fossil fuels in the ground, specifically by the use of clean energy contracts. That's 3 o'clock tomorrow here on UPTV. On Sunday at 3.30 p.m., the Populist Dialogues, a rebroadcast. At 4 p.m., Labor's Worldview with our friends David Johnson and Jim Iman. Uh, weekdays in the coming week, Monday through Friday at 7 a.m., Democracy Now! At 8 a.m., The Big Picture. At noon, The David Pakman Show. On Monday, that's the 24th, uh, at 5 p.m., the European Journal, uh, the Tom Hartman program will not be seen uh, this week at 2 p.m., the afternoon program, the live call-in, due to fundraising on free speech television. On Tuesday, the 25th, at 5 p.m., In Focus, the Muslim Targets rebroadcast, and at 10 p.m., Aware on the Air, starring Ron Zoke. Now, I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussions tonight on News from Neptune have been David Green and Ron Zoke. 
This and other editions of the program can be seen on the website, newsfromneptune.com, and on Facebook. Uh, I can be reached at Carl at newsfromneptune.com and on Facebook, and I'm happy to receive your comments. Our thanks to UPTV, UPTV, especially Jake, Jason, and Caleb. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune to remind you in the words of Edward de Vere, what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion your enemies, and a good night to you.